Good morning and welcome to Bible Study. Hello, YouTube peoples. Um, this morning, we are going to be looking at Chapter 2 of Joshua. And as was previously mentioned, with the intro into Joshua, it's taken for granted that the reader has some understanding of the persons, the places, and subject matter of the figurative message of the eternal covenant in the luminaries. This is, so if you're just reading through it, it's just taken for granted that you would have some of this understanding. And the sons of Israel, of the household of Abraham, had understanding of the message of the stars with their signs, and in fact had been taught this truth, along with the figurative pictorials of the ceremonial law, and so some of the details expressed in figure in the book are not necessary to comment on. So this is a really, this is something to really lay a hold of because you're thinking, okay, there's figurative language in the text. The figurative language in the text has to do with the eternal covenant and the luminaries. It has to do with the ceremonial law. And if you don't have any of that, if you're not a son of Israel and you've never been taught, the figurative message in the luminaries, or you don't have any understanding of the figures of the ceremonial law, this could be a problem, right? <laughs> so I want us to start thinking that way. So here's the figurative message, and I want us to see and understand that figurative expressions are a common tool of communication that are used today and more readily acceptable than we realize. Mm -hmm. Okay, we speak in figures all the time, and we don't even know that we're doing that. For example, I'm going to give you some modern-day uh, figurative pictorials. When describing an object that is no longer functioning as intended, we say it has died, right? meaning it's no longer working. However, as it was not living to begin with, right, the statement is without common sense. right? And yet, because it's figurative, we all have understanding of what's being expressed, right? right? Or how about these? When someone is sad or ill, we might say they're blue or under the weather. Right? We don't even really have an explanation of what that means, but we still understand what's being expressed, yes? Okay. Or, I'm green with envy. I'm not really, but I'm green with envy, or he's a snake, stubborn as a mule, she's slow as molasses, right? Or, as a friend said to me the other day, they had an American Thanksgiving. Now there's a lot of detail expressed in that one sentence, right? Again, figurative, but clearly I understood what was meant. Now the thing about figurative expressions, or the figurative message that's in the luminaries and that's in the ceremonial law, the thing about the figurative is that that message often uses colors and numbers and gives a clearer picture more than words can describe, right? For example, let's go back to he's a snake, I don't know, I just picked that one. He's a snake. Now, you have something in your mind, do you not? Well, what about that snake? It's kind of icky, slimy, slimy. Icky. issy, right? <laughs> you have this whole thing. Rather than he's a snake, if you read he's a snake, you think he's a snake. But because it's figurative, you can have a picture in your mind, right? Maybe he's a big snake. Maybe he's a little snake. Okay. So all of that to say that once the message of the figurative is understood, there is depth to be gleaned in the pictorial. Okay? So what we're learning to do is to think figuratively in the book of Joshua. Okay? So are you in Joshua? Okay, Joshua 2.6. But she had brought them up to the roof of the house, speaking of Rahab, and hid them with stalks of flax, which she had laid in order upon the roof. Okay, here is an example of figurative. You're thinking, it is? Yes, it is. See, to the modern readers, this is a 
bit of interesting information, right? But what does that have to do with the story other than she hid the spies under the stocks? Isn't that where your mind goes? Yeah. Like, okay. This is where we're going to start asking the Lord to train our thinking. As we know, flax is the plant linen is made from. Okay, so we think, okay, here are the stalks of flax. We know that linen is made from flax. We know who wore linen garments. Linen garments were worn by royalty and priests, all right? And if Rahab was possibly a priestess, having been one of those ite nations, this would explain why she was drawing flax on a rooftop. See, now isn't that a lot more interesting than she took them up and hit them under the stalks of flax? Okay, that's okay. So, figuratively, within the language of symbolism in the scripture, linen speaks of righteousness. Okay? Now, righteousness, this figure of righteousness, righteousness is an emblem of moral purity. Okay? Now you're thinking, who wears linen? Priests and kings. Okay, so now that gives you an idea of the morality the, of, of the priests and the kings, correct? Okay. Now, having said all of that, from this little verse, if you were a son of Israel later reading this, or even in the camp, Immediately upon hearing that the spies had been hidden under the flax, the sons of Israel would equate the hiding of the spies under the flax with the moral purity of the righteousness of the covenant son. Why? Because they have a teaching. See? That we don't. And the life of the spies being made safe from the destruction of death right, being hidden under the stalks of the flax, through resurrection on the basis of the righteousness offered in the covenant son. So there would be two things they would be thinking of, the moral purity of righteousness and being made safe, right, from the destruction of death through the resurrection on the basis of the righteousness offered in the covenant son. Okay. Now, having said all that, which was a mouthful, the heavens declare the glory of God. They've been taught the figurative message of the luminaries, right? This figurative emblem of the righteousness of God is first declared in the stars with their signs in Libra. Here's Libra. This is where this message of righteousness is first declared. Now, Libra is the constellation depicting eternity past. So what did I just say? Okay, let me see. Righteousness is first depicted in the stars with their signs in Libra. And Libra is the sign that depicts the eternity past. Well, what's in eternity past? God. God. That's right. God, right? So in figure, in the figurative message of the sign Libra, the righteousness of God is declared in the provision that's made by the transaction of propitiation to cover the nakedness of man because man without a garment of glory is considered naked, right? Now we have this provision made by the transaction of propitiation in Libra which is the sign in eternity past so that the nakedness of man is covered that he might become a son of God and this righteous transaction of propitiation is seen as accomplished in eternity past, which means before the creation of humanity. Isn't that a lot to see from one little piece of linen? <laughs> see, here is this picture. It's just getting bigger and bigger and bigger, isn't it? So in eternity past, basically, God has everything in his creation of humanity covered through the transaction of propitiation, that transaction of righteousness before he ever starts anything. That's a God you could trust, right? So, God's seed of righteousness, the birth son of God, come in the flesh is the transaction of propitiation. Here is the power of God unto salvation 
to deliver his creation of humanity from the wages of sin, death. And where is this first picture? Libra. Libra, in eternity before we have a creation. Thus, the mortal, temporary body of the creation of humanity designed to return to the dust, mm -hmm. right? It's not, was it meant to live forever? This mortal body of creation of humanity designed to return to the dust is dead because of sin. Why is it dead because of sin? Who brought in death and sin? Man. Man. Okay. So here is this mortal body of creation designed to return to the dust of the ground as it always was, but now is dead because of sin. But in eternity past, God's seed of righteousness, the birth son of God, before he came in the flesh, had it all covered in the transaction, the righteous transaction of propitiation. He had sin covered and he had the wages of sin covered, which was death. Now, the mortal body of the creation of humanity, designed to return to the dust, is dead because of sin. And the word for dead has the meaning of a corpse. Okay? Now, if you look at this body, look at your own, <laughs> right? You would not think it's dead. Okay? You might acknowledge, yes, it's corrupting. Oops, I forgot to tell you, please turn off your cell phones. Okay. But here it is. It's dead because of sin. <coughs> right? Hence, you could say, or I am going to say, here is the creation of humanity that are dead men walking. Right? They're dead men walking, and not only are they dead men walking, they're awaiting the execution of destruction, which is death. Mm -hmm. See, we have everything backwards, don't we? So here he is, a creation of humanity, dead man walking, dead because of sin, waiting for the execution of destruction, death, death being the wages of sin. Okay. Now, suddenly you have to say to yourself, well, what is death? See, because we think death rather than dead and then waiting for the destruction of death, <laughs> right? Death has the rights and privilege to destroy the mortal temporary seed body of flesh covering the man. And so what's understood is that the body dead because of sin is owed the recompense of death. It's owed the wages of death. Okay? The body is owed to be destroyed in destruction. But the transaction of propitiation is take care of that. And when did he take care of that? In eternity past. Okay, so, figured in the stars with their signs in the heavenly revelation, which the signs of Ezra were taught, figured in these signs in the heavenly revelation, and according to the scriptures, their law, okay, there are two resurrections. The resurrection unto life and the resurrection of the damned. Hence what we see is that the mortal, temporary seed body, dead because of sin, sown in corruption to return to dust, is to be restored to a condition of life in order to receive the resurrection of eternal life, a body of glory like unto the covenant sons of the resurrection, or damned. Okay. The seed body is raised up again to be destroyed in death. Now maybe this is something you've never really considered or thought upon. I, I hadn't, 
really in terms of the body, you know, who, who really thinks on resurrection all that much? That's okay. We don't. So, <laughs> right? Now, as I said, previously mentioned, Abraham had commanded his children and his household after him, right? The way of the Lord. What was the way of the Lord? Well, the way of the Lord was the figurative message of that which God had taught him that night under the stars. Do you remember that? So, God taught Abraham. Abraham's going to teach his household after him. This is the way of the Lord. This is what... And see, not only did he have this teaching, but because he had the offering for the land, then we have the beginning of offerings. And, and what does that mean? And what are those animals? And how does... You see what I'm saying? So, going back to verse 6, the spy is hidden... Right? With the stalks of flax, those sons of Israel would have readily grasped the figurative message of the spies hidden under the life of the stalks of flax. See? They, they would have got it. Not only would the spies have gotten it, but when they came back and told the rest of the camp, everybody else would have gotten it because they have this teaching. See? So, not only do they have the grasp of reality of the figure of the spies being hidden under the stalks of flax, because there's two spies, two, the ordinal which speaks figuratively of the witness, now we're adding to the figure, okay? They would have understood figuratively that the two spies of the sons of God were a witness, right, to the love of God as they rested in quiet confidence in the abundance of the grace of the righteousness of God. See? They, they would have gotten the whole picture. We read, they're hiding under stalks of flax. <laughs> now, if you think about this for half a minute, or maybe less, really? Stalks of flax? I mean, that doesn't seem like a very good hiding place to me. <laughs> right? <laughs> and, the next thing to consider is, why is it in the text? I mean, you could take that out and not really miss a beat. Unless, of course, you had understanding of the figures. Mm -hmm. Then you realize this is significant. This is in here for a purpose. There is something that God is declaring. Now, continuing with our verse 6, the stalks of flax which Rahab hid the spies under also declares the season of the year. Okay. Wait, do you think of the season of the year when you read that verse? Mm -hmm. No. Okay, the harvest of flax, the cutting off of the life of the flax, is in the twelfth month. That's the month of Adar in the Hebrew calendar, and the month of Adar is in the spring. It's February or March. That's the month, okay? Meaning, the spies were hiding under the flax in the spring, the twelfth month, figuratively presenting the pictorial of the life of the covenant sun cut off in the spring, because that's what the flax are representing, is it not? So here is flax that's been cut off in the spring. The flax goes with the linen. The linen goes with the covenant sun. The covenant sun is speaking of righteousness. Do you see how we're building? Yeah. And where are the spies? They're underneath those stalks of flax that represent figuratively the cutting off of the covenant sun's life for them. Okay. See, I hear that. Can I have that? Like, awesome. That is like, yeah, okay. Yeah. So, now here's a question I want to ask you. When you think of the 12th month, do you think spring or winter? Uh, ah, <laughs> uh, yes, see? <laughs> because we need to be thinking Eastern and Jewish, not Western and Christian. Okay. It helps, keeps the figures straight in the pictorial that you're looking at. And that's a really hard discipline. So this is why I'm encouraging us. We have to start thinking this way. And you have to ask the Lord, show me. Because when you read through the scriptures and you're reading this story, this is a real event with real people and real things happening. And like I said, when you get to verse 6, you're thinking, okay, she hid them under flax, big deal. But when you're saying, okay, Lord, 
I mean, we could, like I said, take it, take the verse out. And, but here's something that God, God does everything with purpose and design. Okay? Now, are you Jewish with me this morning? Okay. So, as a Jew, you're knowing the 12th month is the month of Adar. Well, the name Adar means strength, glorious. Hmm. Whose strength and glory are they hiding under? Christ. Okay. And the stars with their signs of Adar, the month of Adar, is Aquarius. Okay. Now, the figurative message of the sign of Aquarius is the record of living waters. The record of the life giver poured out, his life poured out, for all nations and peoples. See, this eternal covenant is not just for Israel. For God so loved the world, world you see. But this is kind of giving you a setting of what's actually taking place. So you read in chapter 2, verse 6, they're hiding under this stock. You know what month it is. Ah. Okay. It's 12th month, somewhere in there. Now the Hebrew calendar, which I'm not going to go, go into this going to this, but the Hebrew calendar is a lunar calendar, meaning that months are based on the lunar phases. Okay? But years are based on the solar years. Okay? Now, why is this important? Because the planting and harvest seasons are according to the lunar calendar. Are you with me so far? Okay. So you think, okay, so the Hebrew calendar is a lunar calendar. They're planting and harvesting seasons according to the phases of the moon, right? They've got a system down. And so then you say to yourself, say, why is this important that we know this? Go ahead, you can. Why is it important okay. that we know this? Well, it's important because of the figurative message that the moon and the seasons and the type of grain pictured in regards to certain aspects of the plan of the eternal covenant. Okay. This is, God's got it all ordered and arranged. He knows exactly. The problem is we don't know exactly what he's doing, right? So, you're thinking, okay, 12th month spring, not winter, hiding under the stalks of flax, right? This is important to know because of the moon with its phases and the seasons and the types of grain because all of those things are pictorial right, of not only the covenant sun but the plan. Mm -hmm. So here's our time frame in Joshua from two verses in the book. I just wanted to show you how this works out. Thus the time frame runs accordingly. Moses died at the end of the 11th month or the beginning of the 12th. And you have that recorded in Deuteronomy 43. So he dies, and the children of Israel weep for him for 30 days. Okay? And then, on the 10th day of the first month, the people came up out of Jordan. Now, how many times have we read something like this in Scripture and thought nothing about it? Right? Again, it's a figure, okay? and it's important. The first month, the month of Nisan, according to the Hebrew calendar, the first month, the name of Nisan is Banner, Standard, a Miracle. Okay? So, you're thinking, okay, what happened in the first month? Oh, this is the month the people came up out of Jordan, and here's something else. The first month is the month the barley and wheat grain are harvested. Hmm. So what we're going to be seeing here in figure is a miracle <laughs> flown like a banner or a standard. Now, the sign that's associated with the first month is the month of Pisces. And Pisces, figuratively, with its stars and signs, expresses the kingdom of God is having come, and the fishes of the sea of humanity under his jurisdiction. See, that's what's figured. See, well, how does all that take place? Well, Israel has to do what she's going to do first. Are you with me? Mm -hmm. Okay. So, 
Where are the spies? They're hiding under the stalks of flax in the 12th month. The first month is just around the corner, right? And on the first month, the 10th day of the month, they're going to cross Jordan and be on, in Canaan. Are you with me? Mm -hmm. Okay. So we know the, the stalks of flax are in the 12th month, and we know that the barley and the wheat are harvested in the first month, or planted in the first month, okay? Mm -hmm. So, although the seed grains of barley and wheat are planted at the same time, right, they're harvested at different times of the year, just a few weeks apart. Okay. Now, the barley is harvested first, and then the wheat. Figuratively, in the language of symbolism, the barley grain is considered the lowest of the grains. It's the least expensive. Right? While the wheat is the most expensive. Do you think there might be a picture there? Okay. Now, each seed grain is a figure of a seed body. The barley in figure is a seed flesh of humanity. The least expensive, right? Because why? It's temporary? Okay. Here is the least expensive grain, the barley in figure, a seed flesh of humanity, but this seed flesh is made in the image of God. Temporary but important to God. Are you with me? And the life form of that body is blood. Likewise, the wheat grain is also a figure of a seed body of flesh. The wheat is the seed flesh of a son of God. The seed made in the image of God after his likeness, flesh and bone. The life form of that body Spirit life, eternal life. Okay. Now then, as the seasons of planting and harvesting clearly depicts, the seed grain of both the barley and the wheat are planted at the same time, but harvested at different. Mm -hmm. I can see some of you are tracking, right? <laughs> this is pretty exciting. So, well, what does that mean? What's the miracle of that in this first month, the 10th day of the month? What, what is the miracle of this? Well, in the text of Joshua, the figure of the seed grains depicts the second generation of Israel, the barley grain, as being harvested Wheat, a covenant people. The day the people came up out of Jordan, on the tenth day of the first month. Here is this picture. Buried in death in the waters, right, of the Jordan, they were resurrected in the land of promise. See how much more there is to gather just in the pictures? Now, do you not think if you were a son of Israel and you went over through the Jordan, you're in, you're in Canaan, and you know exactly what month you're in and what's being harvested and how, when it was, see, do you get the picture? Okay. Now then. All that from flax. Isn't that neato? Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. So, having seen this one little figure, expressive figure, which as sons of Israel you would have gotten, and now we get because we understand, oh, this figures this, and this figures this, and this, right? And a figure only takes you so far, but it's showing you something, and like I said with he's a snake, you can see a lot more, right, than just the little words. Now, if, if someone had actually wrote all of that after verse 6, we never get through Joshua, right? But you can see how it's all laid out, right? So, we're going back to Rahab. Now remember, Rahab has been justified. How is she justified? Through faith? Okay. 
So, after sharing her faith with the two spies in verses 8 through 11, Rahab made a request of deliverance from the known destruction coming upon the city. She said, I know that the Lord has given you the land. Okay, that's, she's pretty assured there. Right? And who is she sharing this with? The spies. So the spies aren't sharing it with her. She's sharing it with them. She learns that, uses the name Jehovah, Yahweh, the personal covenant-keeping name. I know. Okay? I know this is what's happening. And what we see in figure is that there's no place too dark that he cannot light up with his presence of life and love. Okay? I mean, just think that the one little person, there she is, right in this city that's not been offered the peace treaty, that's slated for destruction, and she says, I know the Lord has given you this. Okay? Rahab's heart has safely trusted in her salvation. Yahweh, see, he loves her, and she knows it, okay? Where once ruled the arrogance of a haughty spirit of enmity and the pride of self-esteem, there was a change of character, okay? In her submission to the Lord God to reign in her life by the gift of righteousness, see how it all goes back, okay? Given her in the covenant son, she knows that Jericho will fall by the judgment of the Lord. Now, if you didn't have all the other, that'd freak you out, wouldn't it? <laughs> but no, her heart can rest, just like the spies could rest under the stalks. Do you see the picture? So, beginning in verse 12, she asks of the spies kindness for kindness. She's going to do them a kindness, and she wants them to do a kindness back. So she says, now therefore I pray you, swear unto me, since I have showed you kindness by hiding you, right, that you will also show kindness unto my father's house, and give me a true token, and that you will save alive my father, and my mother, and my brethren, and my sisters, and all that they have, and deliver our lives from death. And the men answered her, Our life for yours, if you utter not this our business. And it shall be, when the Lord hath, kind, hath given us the land, we will deal kindly and truly with thee. Okay. So, first things first. What has Rahab done? She has humbled herself under the mighty hand of God. Right? And having done so, now she asks kindness for kindness. And asking kindness to kindness, the Lord extends his kindness to the salvation of her father's house from the deliverance of the destruction of Jericho. Okay. Now, as to the end result of her family, scripture's silent. I couldn't find anything about her family. But one cannot help but be hopeful as to the power of love to convict them and convince them of their need of eternal life. See? <clears throat> but for Rahab personally, the blessings continue. Not only is there a deliverance from the judgment of Jericho, right? She's also delivered from sin. Okay? And delivered from the power of death to destroy the body, having been made the righteousness of God in Christ, his covenant son. So I want to say that again because it is so powerful and we treat it so blasé, okay? Here she is. She has been delivered from sin. What does that mean? She's no longer under the authority in the master sin, right? She does not have to sin because she's been delivered from it. Okay? Like, de delivered? Delivered from it. And... Not only has she been delivered from sin, she doesn't have to abide by the rule of sin. She has also been delivered from the power of death to destroy this body. Okay. Because she has been made the righteousness of God in Christ, his covenant son. Okay. So figuratively, Rahab 
is clothed with the garment of righteousness through the seed of the covenant son. Can you see that? So how does she see herself? Like this? Absolutely. See? If she continues to think of herself like this, where's the power? There isn't any. But that's not how she sees herself. She knows she's been delivered from sin and delivered from the power of death to destroy this body, having been made the righteousness of God in Christ, his covenant son. She understands it figuratively. She's clothed in a garment of righteousness. And because she's clothed in the garment of righteousness, she understands it's the seed, the covenant son. Okay. Now, as I had said a, few, a couple weeks ago, Rahab would, through marriage, one day wed a man named Solomon, who belonged to the king's tribe, Judah. And as I said, I think it was last week or the week before, I can't honestly remember, <laughs> Rahab's name is listed in the genealogical record of Jesus, the covenant son, the high priest and heir of the kingdom of God in Matthew. Okay? Now here's something you may not have known, or actually saw, but didn't know it actually had a name. As with most genealogies listed in scripture, the king's genealogy recorded in Matthew is referred to as a genealogical compression. Okay. History can be told in a variety of ways, through narrative, poetry, or genealogy. Those are three ways that are laid out in scriptures. Okay? What is a compression genealogy? A compression genealogy is designed as a means of retelling history and instead of single individuals succeeding one another, okay, there is the unilinear descending of the genealogy. What does that mean? That means, had I thought of what I was looking at a couple weeks ago, in reference to the genealogy in Matthew, the genealogy in Matthew has to do with the king's genealogy, correct? Mm -hmm. Okay. Had I been thinking about that, the genealogy of the kings, and the generations that are mentioned in Matthew 1, rather than focusing on my subject, which happened to be Rahab, that's where my mind was, I would have realized that Rahab did not bear Boaz. Okay, as I stated in the last lesson or two lessons or whatever it was. She didn't bear it. The reason being is that Salmon and Rahab belong to the history period of Joshua, whereas Boaz belongs to the late period of the judges of Israel. We're talking way down the line. Okay. But it's laid out the way that it does in genealogy like that, so it can tell a history. And you have the same thing in Genesis uh, 4 with Cain's line. Genesis 5 with the sons of Adam, it's, that's how it's laid out. Mm -hmm. There's a way that there, the, the text is expressing a history, and the history pertains to whatever it is within the text. Are you with me? Okay. Sorry about that, but I was focused on Rahab, what can I say? So, <laughs> now, so here she is, okay, she's secure in her standing as um, a son of God. She recognizes that she has the righteousness of God. So continuing on, I want to read verses 15 up through 21. Then she let them down by a cord through the window, for her house was upon the town wall, and she dwelt upon the wall. And she said to them, Get you to the mountain, lest your pursuers meet you and hide yourself there three days until the pursuers be returned and afterward you may go your way. So here's her instructions to them and here are their instructions to her. And the men said to her, We will be blameless of this thine oath which thou hast made us swear. Behold, when we come into the land, thou shalt bind this line of scarlet thread in the window which thou hast did let us down by, and thou shalt bring thy father, thy mother, thy brethren, and all thy father's household home unto thee. And it shall be that whosoever shall go out of the doors of thy house into the street, his blood shall be upon his head. And we will be guiltless. 
and whosoever shall be with thee in the house, his blood will be on our head, if any hand be upon him. And if you utter this our business, then we will be quit of thine oath, which thou hast made us to swear. And she said, According to your words, so be it. And she sent them away, and they departed, and she bound the scarlet line in the window. So this is where we are, right? So we have this little interaction. Now Rahab, receiving the three B's of the spy's instruction, which is keep our business to yourself, bind this line of scarlet in your window, and bring thy father's house into thee, she let them down by the court in the window. Okay? So Rahab is instructed not to utter her business with the spies. Why? Because the city is slated for destruction. Mm -hmm. See? This, these are enemies. Mm -hmm. This city is one of the inheritances of Israel, and they're not to offer peace. Okay? And you're thinking, well, that doesn't seem very nice. But we have to think of why God said that. We have to go back to the ites of those nations and the condition and why they're slated for destruction. Okay. So she's not to utter her business with the spies. And she's instructed that the spies will be blameless of her oath if she does not follow their instructions. Okay. Israel didn't swear by anything. See, they were instructed not to do this. So here's an oath that she's saying, show me a token, right? And so they're saying, okay, we're going to do that, but you can't, you know, you have to not share our business. You have to bind the cord and you have to bring your, okay, you, go, you have a part in this. What we need to understand is that the kindness that Rahab is asking for is seen of the spies not as a matter of doing a good deed. Right? but a matter of life and death. Mm -hmm. See? This is serious business and not to be entered into lightly. Why? Because they're sons of Israel. Right? They're covenant people of Jehovah. They think of themselves as belonging to, not themselves, but to God. See? So this is a business that they're not entering into lightly. The city is slated for destruction. She has asked an oath of the spies, and the word translated oath has the meaning of a sacred promise. Okay? The oath was considered to be unbreakable. It's an unbreakable contract. Okay. Now, there's not been any bloodshed. It's not a covenant, but it is a contract, and it's a sacred contract. And the idea is this unbreakable contract, this sacred promise the spies swear to keep, was their life for hers. That's pretty sacred. Say, So, that's the deal for this unbreakable oath. Back up to Joshua 18. So they say to her, bind when we come into the land, that when we come into behold, when we come into the land, thou shalt bind this line of scholar thread in the window which thou didst let us down by. So obviously they're not down yet, but they're telling her, do this because we're going to go down. And when you put this in the window, right? Because the city, the, her house is on the town wall. Right? Could you see the spy? This is serious. This is the spy's life is involved. Her life is involved. Hmm. I think it was that house. <laughs> Would give me a minute, the, right? So it's that one, the one that has the cord in the window. No mistaking, see? Very smart. Now, just like all the other figures, there is the figurative language of color. Colors are a universal language. The language of color, as well as the first colors of the creation, are first seen in the stars, okay? with their signs in the eternal covenant in the heavens. It's just beautiful because you can see the covenant has to do with what God is doing. Right? Now, the stars 
that an unaided eye can see vary in magnitude from principal stars of minus one down to the sixth magnitude. Star positions depend on the direction of the sun according to Earth's orbit. The colors of the stars flash, <coughs> excuse me, the color of the star flash are white, red, blue, green, yellow, and orange. Okay. The covenant colors, right, because they're stars, and that's where the covenant is seen. The covenant colors in the luminaries add life to the message revealed in the star names with their signs. You see how it keeps building and building and building, the figurative, right? Scarlet is a brilliant red color with a tinge of orange. In the spectrum of visible light and on the traditional color wheel, it is one quarter of the way between red and orange. Scarlet is slightly less than orange. Now, red speaks of love. It also speaks of the dust of the ground from whence the body of man was formed and bloodshed. While orange red speaks of the son of righteousness in the scriptures, speaks of God's seed with healing in his wings. Okay. So, <clears throat> The scarlet line that the spies chose for Rahab to hang in the window speaks, by its color, of safety through sacrifice. It's a figurative message. Do you see? The Hebrew used for scarlet in this text is actually the word crimson. Sorry, I got to get a drink. There are two definitions of the word scarlet used in the scripture. One refers to the color itself, and the other refers to a worm, which the color is derived from. Okay, so, do you think there might be a picture? Okay, I'm just seeing, so. There is another word translated scarlet in the King James Version, but it is actually the color purple. The word used for scarlet in Joshua is referring to the color, the color, and not the worm. Okay. However, due to the pictorial, we're going to be considering the crimson word used to dye the fabrics red. We're going to be considering the worm, right? Because that's the figure mm -hmm. of salvation through the scarlet. Are you with me? Okay. Now, the Hebrew word translated cord, <clears throat> a masculine or feminine noun in verse 15, is the word line, a feminine noun, in verses 18 and 21. Translated cord, the, mean, the word has many meanings depending on the context. That's why when you're reading the word, it's important to think Eastern Jewish and then ask the Lord to help you. <laughs> See, it's a practicing of slowing your mind down. See, it's like, what, what is God actually saying here? Why did he change words? How important can that be? Okay. The word is used figuratively to speak of the cords of sin and death. It can be translated destruction, pangs or sorrow and connection to childbirth. It is also used to describe a dividing line. Israel's getting ready to go in. What's the dividing line? Yahweh. Hey. The Hebrew word translated line is referring to a cord or a line made of bright red thread with a tinge of orange. Figuratively, the noun refers to hope and expectation. Okay. Where is your hope and expectation? In the deliverance of her salvation? Right. The word line refers to an attitude of anticipation with the expectation that something will happen. The hope. Say, hey, this is what she's hoping for. This is what they told her to do. This is what she's... And you noticed, when did she hang it up there? Not when they came into the land, but when? As soon as they were down. The line's up. Right? Now, due to the context of the text, I figuratively believe that the masculine noun referring to the cord 
is speaking of the dividing line between the destruction of the city of Jericho and the line of hope that was Rahab's to hang her hope on. Okay. It's just beautiful, right? Figuratively, the feminine noun of hope and the expectation of the seed of the woman is the begotten Son of God. See? It is faith in Him, the only begotten Son of God, that the expectation of the deliverance is available. This is where she's placing her hope. Right? Right here. Now, I'm checking something out here. Okay. Here is the description of the crimson worm, because that's how we get the red, the scarlet, okay, is from the worm. The crimson color used to dye fabrics comes from a very special worm called the toloth, which means crimson worm or scarlet. The crimson worm looks more like a grub than a worm. Okay. Now think about this. If we didn't have this information, we would just think she hung a scarlet. But when you think about the process, see, it again opens up this picture, right? So grubs are larvae, they're maggots. Okay? So from this little maggot, right, this Magnet, maggot is a lowly looking worm. From this lowly looking worm, its appearance provides the rich color of scarlet. Its appearance provides the color of love and sacrifice. <clears throat> when it's time for the female crimson worm to have her babies, which she only does once in her life, when she has her babies, the result is her death. And when she gets ready to have her baby, she finds the trunk of a tree, a wooden fence post, or a stick. And she attaches her body to that wood and makes a hard crimson shell. It's so strong and permanently stuck to the wood that the shell can never be removed without tearing her body completely apart and killing her. Mm -hmm. The crimson worm lays her eggs under her body and the protective shell. When the baby larva hatch, they stay under the shell. Not only does the mother's body give protection, but it also provides them with food. The babies feed on the living body of the mother. Okay. Are, are you getting the picture here? Mm -hmm. Okay. As the crimson mother dies, she oozes a crimson or scarlet red dye, which not only stains the wood she's attached to, but her children as well. <clears throat> After three days, the dead mother's crimson worm's body loses its crimson color, and guess what color it turns to? I'll show you. White! <laughs> See? It turns to white wax, which falls to the ground like snow. Is that incredible? See? Does God want to make himself known or not? Okay. Now obviously, without too much difficulty, the figurative pictorial of the worm, ordinal of the three days, and the process of the color of the scarlet line is as clearly understood see, as that line hanging in the, in the window. Are you with me? Okay. Psalm 22.6 says, I am a worm, and the word is toll off. I am a worm and no man, a reproach of men and despised of the people. Such is the symbolism of the scarlet line. Deliverance from sin, deliverance from death, and deliverance from judgment. Life through sacrifice. Hebrews 11, 31 says, By faith the harlot Rahab perished not with them that believed not, when she had received the spies with peace. So continuing, 22 says <clears throat> that the spies went their way and came into the mountain and abode there three days until the pursuers were returned and the pursuers sought them throughout all the way but found them not. 
So the two men returned, speaking of the spies, and descended from the mountain, and passed over, and came to, the, to Joshua the son of Nun, and told him all the things that befell them. Okay. Now personally, I think they told him all the things, like, oh, we were safe under the righteousness of the covenant son. And she hung this up. You see what I'm saying? Because that's their experience. That's their understanding of God. Now, there are three different areas of locations mentioned in the three chapters of Joshua. There's Shittim, where everybody's camped at the moment, and the Fords, which is somewhere along the River Jordan. And then there's Jordan. That's Jordan, Land King, okay? Shittim, as I said, is where the nation is camped before the return of the spies. See, there's the spies. They're still there. Okay. The fords are the area where the king's men head in pursuit of the spies. And Jordan is the area where the children lodged before they cross over to go into Canaan. So here's Shittim, here's Jordan, right? Here's the river Jordan, and here's Canaan. Are you with me? Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, the river's name in Hebrew, Jordan, is derived from the meaning descending or flowing down. And its waters are valuable for irrigation. The Jordan is fed by many small streams and headways in Syria and Lebanon. It's deep and turbulent in the rainy season, which happens to be spring. <laughs> okay? The river is not navigable, which is evident. It's not navigable anyway, but it's really not navigable in the rainy season. Okay? which is evident as the king's men head in their pursuit of the spies in the direction of the fords. Mm -hmm. okay. The fords is a place on land or in a river where a crossing can be undertaken. So somewhere along here in our river Jordan, there's a place the spies could cross. I mean the king's men. Right? And obviously where the king's men are attempting to cross is the same spot the spies must have used to cross over, right? Okay. However, the spies, having received Rahab's instructions, head in the opposite direction. They don't go towards the forts, they go towards the mountain. Okay, so you've got this, this deal going. They went to high ground. The mountain abiding figuratively in the heavenly realm. That's where they are. Okay. They stay there three days until the pursuers return. Right? Once the pursuers return, the spies return, descending from the mountain, and pass over the fords and come to the place that Joshua is lodging in, Sh in Shittim. It's very, very practical. So once they come back, verse 24, they say unto Joshua, Truly the Lord has delivered into our hands all the land. For even all the inhabitants of the country do faint because of us. See? Now, they're still here in Shittim. They haven't even moved to the Jordan yet. But the spies have come back and said, hey, this is the deal, right? That would pump you up, wouldn't it? I mean, you're already excited because you know you're getting ready to go across the Jordan. And now you have the testimony of the two spies saying, listen, the Lord truly has delivered into our hands all the land. Okay? Truly, he's done this. So, even before Israel crosses the Jordan, right? Even before, we haven't got this part in the text, but I'm just showing this. Even before they have set the stones of remembrance in the Jordan and the stones of a memorial in the land, even before they have circumcised and partaken of the Passover in the land, all of these are future events, right? We're not there yet. What does is, what is Israel declare? All the inhabitants of the country do faint because of us. See? What they're saying is the victory is the Lord's. See? They're all excited. So here in picture is a picture of what will one day be. One day Israel will die and be raised to come in a people. She's not yet, is she? This is all figurative. Right? One day she will die and be raised a covenant of people, born sons of God. She will look on him whom she has pierced, and in a day be born, a nation. 
Isaiah 65, 9 says, I will bring forth a seed out of Jacob and out of Judah, an inheritor of my mountains, and my elect shall inherit it, and my servants shall dwell there. For behold, I create Jerusalem a rejoicing, and her people joy. And I will rejoice in Jerusalem, and joy in my people, and the voice of weeping shall no more be heard in her, nor the voice of crying. The future, but over and over, in figure, God uses the literal events to present what it is he's going to accomplish, and is accomplished according to the eternal covenant. It's as good as done, right? So this takes us to chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. And Joshua rose early in the morning, and they removed from Shittim, and they came to Jordan. And he and all the children of Israel lodged there before they passed over. And it came to pass, after three days, that the officers went through the host. Right? So what verses 1 and 2 of chapter 3 do, is they take the reader back to verse 10 of chapter 1. So you have all of the stuff that was given to, to the reader, to let know this is the all these things happened before we actually crossed over. You see? And all the figurative within it. Now here's a personal thinking I'm thinking. Just off the top of my little head. Not only is the River Jordan not navigable, right? It's turbulent during this time of season. It overflows its banks, actually. Okay? They have to cross at the fords. Now, if there were, they were anybody in the land could have said, or Israel could have said, well, we just crossed the fords. It was narrow, and it took us a while, right? But it's passable at this point. So what do they do? They move down to Jordan, or up, I guess it would be, right? Why? So the glory of God, right, could part the waters, mm -hmm. see? So nobody mistakes, right? That this is the Lord's doing, right? And that Jehovah is Israel's God, the true and living. So, this concludes the lesson. Thank you very much for being patient. In preparation for next week's figures, I know this week you didn't get to prepare, but next week you will if you will look at this. I would like you please to read Joshua chapter 3, verses 3 through 5, and Exodus 25 verses 1 through 22. And I'm going to give you a little hint because I just love little hints. You want to just uh, repeat Exodus. that? Chapter 25 verses 1 through 22. When we go back to chapter 3. Oh, oh, wait, 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 sorry. That was the wrong. Um, no, that's the right, that's the right text. Let me see here. Yeah, that's the right text. When Israel gets ready to cross, to go over into Canaan, there's no mention any longer of two things in the book of Joshua. There's no mention of the glory cloud, and there's no mention of the tabernacle until the end of Joshua, when Israel gets her allotted land, okay? What is mentioned is the Ark of the Covenant. So it's very important that we take a, take a lesson, which is what we're going to do next week, and look at that Ark of the Covenant, what it figures, how it's made, when it was made, all of those little details that are super significant, because now this is what Israel is to follow as the Ark. Okay? So it would be really helpful if you read those passages of Scripture so that you're better able to track with me next week. Okay? All right, that concludes our lesson. Amen in Jesus' name.